Ma'am. Namaste, everyone. Welcome uh, to this uh, webinar featuring Dr. Uh, R. Nagaswamy. Uh, my name is Sahana Singh. I am director at uh, Indian History Awareness and Research, which is a 501c3 nonprofit organization based in Houston. Uh, but of course, our members are from all over the world. It is a growing family. Uh, so the, uh, the vision of IHAR is uh, revealing timeless India through its historical narratives. As we all know, India, uh, uh, the more, India is an enigma. The more we seek to know about it, the more there is to know. So, and it keeps revealing itself to us as we come to know more about it. Hence the vision that we have. And uh, revealing India's uh, historical narratives is important not, not just for India, but for the whole world. There is a lot of knowledge here, which the whole world uh, needs uh, in today, uh, today's times, especially uh, when COVID is raging uh, across different countries. So um, to, to set the tone for today's uh, webinar, we are, uh, the, the topic is uh, Tamil Nadu and the Vedas. Uh, as we know, uh, there has been a concerted effort to uh, to show that uh, Tamil Nadu is distinct from uh, the rest of India. So uh, there has been uh, an effort to say that uh, Tamil Nadu is different from Sanskrit. In fact, when I, uh, 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 did, I delivered my talk on India's educational heritage, which uh, was shared quite widely, I got many comments saying that I had not spoken about Tamil. I had not spoken about the spread of Tamil. So when I was talking about the spread of uh, Indian culture and uh, Sanskrit uh, across Southeast Asia, I was told that why, why are, uh, asked, why are you not talking about Tamil? So this is the reason today's uh, webinar is uh, very important. We have somebody like Dr. Nagaswamy to uh, clear the cobwebs for us. We are very lucky because uh, it, it's a rare appearance by him. The last time that uh, he, uh, he, he spoke for, uh, for us was in 2012, when we had our ino uh, inaugural lecture in Houston. Uh, at that time, uh, it was coordinated by Dr. Jai Kumar Amagudi. So to tell you about Dr. Nagaswamy, he is a Padma Bhushan awardee. He is a historian, archaeologist and epigraphist who is known for his work on temple inscriptions and art history of Tamil Nadu. He was also instrumental in starting the annual Chidambaram Natyanjali festival in 1980. He is an authority in Chola bronzes. Dr. Nagaswamy was awarded the Kalai, uh, Kalai Mamani Award by the government of Tamil Nadu for his path-breaking work on Sekilar's Periya Puranam. He appeared as an expert witness in the London High Court uh, in the London Nataraja case. Dr. Nagaswamy has been closely associated with Tamil Nadu's idol theft wing in tracking down stolen idols. So, uh, so today the format will be that Dr. Nagaswamy will speak for about 45 minutes. Uh, this is being uh, telecast live on YouTube. So people can keep typing their questions and I'll keep checking the uh, YouTube uh, live stream. And after the talk, I'll read out the questions uh, to Dr. Nagaswamy. Yes, uh, uh, Dr. Nagaswamy, I will request you to start your talk. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. We're looking forward to learning from you. Please start. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity and I'm very glad to meet you all. Now, I'm going to speak to you about Vedas and Tamil Nadu. First, we should know what is Veda and how is it important for the life of the people particularly India, but it was never confined to India. It went beyond the frontiers of India, going the whole of Southeast Asia, the Central Asia, uh, and West Asia. In all these places, the Vedas have left their imprints, and uh, that will be uh, the source and that will be compared with what we call the Tamil land and the Tamil language. Uh, <coughs> Tamil 
is a very glorious language vedam nirainda tamil nadu says subramanya bharati our most uh, respected uh, poet who lived about 100 years ago vedam nirainda tamil nadu the land full of vedas but unfortunately due to various causes now it is projected by some as different it's not different it can never be different it cannot be isolated from the great country of bharat and also the world so i am starting my talk with what is veda vedas are beautiful poetry composed by great men long 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 time back it is vedas consists of uh, four main branches one rigveda it consists of poetry beautiful poetry on nature's power nature's manifestation like uh, you know rain is deified it is given a beautiful form imagery and the poetry rhythmic poetry like that every aspect of nature's power is given an imagery and rhythmic poetry immortal poetry that has come down for the past 5000 years rigveda is essentially poetry yajurveda the second one these poems were used to invoke the presence of divine power and worship and so yajurveda uses this poetry for worship for ritual purpose both combined poetry and rituals and that constitute the yajurveda samaveda is beautiful poems sung in rhythmic music so samaveda is gana it is generally called samagana and it was uh, used to be sung with veena samatin veena pundar is a tevaram form then we have the fourth one called atharva veda that deals with mainly medicine magic and so on as it is down to earth uh, poetry it is considered a separate one and the other three are called as a trai vedas are called trai now there is another classification of the vedas mantras brahmanas aranyakas and upanishad mantra arises from the word man to recite to remember in your mind and that which protects the person who remembers this uh, poem he is in this mantra brahmana aranyaka and then upanishads upanishad or uh, the highest philosophy that india has given to the world and upanishad is part of our life ever since where the where sun next one now in order to understand these vedas we have some auxiliary text without them it is not possible to understand the meaning the rhythm and for what purpose it is used and so on so these are six in number and these are called shad angas six limbs chandas is the uh, rhythmic uh, poem poem poetry poetics kalpas kalpas are how you draw your vedic altars what are the designs how to do it 
and what is the sequence of puja and invoking the fire. All these are prescribed in Kalpas. They are called Kalpa Sutras. Jyotisha. It is astronomy. Astronomy is very important for Vedic sacrifices because it is calculated on the basis of the uh, what you call grass. Stellar position. It's not future foretelling. It is absolute science, Jyotisha. Nirukta. Nirukta is the science of meaning, studying the meaning of the Vedic words to which deity, the poetry, is addressed to, and so on. So it is essentially to understand the meaning of the Vedic words. Vyakarma is the composition, uh, grammar. And then Ganita is very important for drawing various designs and various uh, poses for the, uh, what you call the uh, <coughs> karma. Karma is rites, rituals. So these six are essential to study the Veda. Mere Veda alone is not sufficient. In order to understand the inner meaning, we need these six. So they always say Veda, Vedangas. Now, Vedic culture has two principal pathways. They are called Marga. One is worldly path. That's called Pravirti Marga. Two, the religious path that is called Nivritti Marga. Pravirti is you are entering into the world of action. Nivritti, you are in, withdrawing yourself into the yourself to realize your greatness and emancipation. So, Pravirti is what we now call secular life of the people. From the Vedas, a code of worldly conduct was compiled into Dharma Shastra. What is Dharma? That which sustains the civilization. Dharati iti Dharma. So Dharma Shastra. Manu's Dharma Shastra, written by Manu, is the earliest. And that dates around 1000 BC. Dharma Shastras are the law courts. They are not mere simple court. They are they have the force of law. And Manu Dharma is the earliest constitution of India. So the entire Indian lifestyle is based on Manu Dharma Shastra. Manu Dharma was not confined to India alone. But I am showing you in my forthcoming book that it was the law of whole of Southeast Asia up to Vietnam, West Asia up to Alexandria, and Central Asia up to Uzbekistan in early period of its existence. Now, you, you, you have the world map. In the world map, you have an arrow showing where Tamil Nadu is located. I say Tamil Nadu should be understood against the whole of uh, the world at large. It's not an isolated uh, piece of land, but it's a part of the world and its proportion needs to be understood before we understand what is Tamil Nadu. I am now going to speak to you about Tamil Nadu, the land of Vedas, from the beginning of history. How Vedic culture and Tamil culture are one and the same. Now here, we have another figure, map, which shows Madras. It's little above Madras. There is the famous uh, Vishnu temple, Tirupadi, Tiruvengadam, Vengadam. That is the northern boundary of uh, Tamil Nadu originally. 
and drive down up to Kanyakumari in the south. So that is the area where uh, people from very early times or historical times, they spoke Tamil and that Tamil continued to this day. It's one of the richest regional cultural language. How far back we go, we are yet to find archaeological evidence, but we are sure at least from about uh, third century BC, there is a continuous life and uh, the use of this language. It is next. Look at this map. There's a river, the famous river, Kaveri River, which goes through uh, right from west to east and joins the sea, Bay of Bengal. So on either side is the uh, Kaveri Basin, and this is called Kaveri Delta. So this was the original home of the classical Tamil. It's called Sen Tamil. And so according to our uh, early uh, grammatical works, Tamil was spoken uh, that is a classical Tamil, natural Tamil, real Tamil in this particular delta. So Tamil Nadi, the Sen Tamil Nadi is this uh, valley, Kaveri Valley, and so Tamil culture is a Kaveri Delta culture. But beyond that, in the south, in the west and north, we have references to 12 small countries which are called uh, where uh, uh, the, uh, the, the Tamil language gets from classical to somewhat spoken. That is colloquial form. It assumes a colloquial form. That is one circle around the classical Tamil land. Then even beyond that, there is a circle of other 12 countries, small countries, where the language, Tamil language, undergoes total uh, uh, change. It is called Thiriswal. Tamil has become a Thiriswal. So we have classical Tamil. Then we have Thiriswal. They have got Thisaichwal. So <coughs> Thisaichwal starts from Vengadam in Tirupati in the north and down at Kanyakumari. That was considered the whole of Tamil country in ancient times. So we have to have three different types of Tamils. One, classical Tamil, then a little colloquial spoken Tamil, and the boundary Tamil, where it mixes with the other languages as in the northern part, which is called Vada Sul. In grammar, Tamil grammar, we are told that we can use all these four words in composing poetry. That is, year 12, Tiri 12, Tisai 12, and Vada Sul. But at no point of time beyond these uh, boundaries, of Vengadam, Tamil went as a mass uh, language to the northern part of India because the other three parts it is covered by the sea. So our Tamil uh, language, Tamil culture, except for parodic visiting of some people from here to north, it was not a very mass movement towards north. Nor do we have. Uh, that it was somewhere located in northern part of India, north western part of India, and people came from there and settled here. And all these are not supported by evidence, except that Tamil, from the very beginning, is located in the Kaveri Basin and within these boundaries. Now, we have 
in india very very early literary compositions apart from uh, apart from you have this um, sanskrit and spoken language called prakrit so tamil is one of the earliest literary language regional literary language that has survived in, in india and there are other prakrit regional prakrit languages but this is a singularly slightly different next one early tamil literature is called classical regional language the history of which is to be traced to second third century bc third century bc we have ashoka maurya who has written his edicts Uh, Dharma Sasana, and there he refers to Tamil like Cheras, Cholas, and Pandya. And thereafter, it had a continuous development through the centuries. However, it had some specific character that dominates certain stages of history, on the basis of which they are divided into different periods. Now the first one we call it Sangam poems up to second century CE, epic poem second to fourth century, bhakti poem fifth to tenth century, medieval poem eleventh to sixteenth century, colonial poem seventeenth to twentieth, and modern poem. Now there existed an association of Tamil poets. in the court of the pandya rulers of madurai in the south who would assemble and evaluate the poems to receive classical status this is an extraordinary literary association known in india that functioned vigorously and hence the poems that were collected into anthology called sangam poems Uh, Dr. Nagaswami, if I may interrupt yes. for a minute, uh, can you, it is not coming in slideshow mode. Uh, it is uh, the next slide is also visible. So if you can make it in slideshow mode. Why is that? Ah, just a second. Slideshow mode, la baat la baat la baat la. What happened? Uh, no, uh, it's a it okay slideshow mode where the whole slide it, fills the screen. Is it okay now? Uh, actually, the next slide is also visible, but you have put it in slideshow mode, is it? Yeah. I see. Okay, then carry on. Then carry on. Is it okay? Several hundred poems have come down to this day. well defined themes and rhythms and grouped into various books there are two broad divisions one dealing with love emotions of different situations of men and women and their aspirations affections separation etc in a well articulated manner there are several hundred poems belonging to this category called aham poetry in the 1st century bc to 2nd century c the second group of poems that deal with heroism liberality war conquest act etc are all called the external life of man known as puram puram poetry most of these are short poems very early poems sangam poem from four lines to about 20 lines each collected into eight books called ettukai eight and but there are a few which are long poems that run from 300 to 400 lines as well consisting of 10 books but 
பத்து பாட்டு டென் சாங் இன் அடிஷன் தெர் ஆர் அதர் குரூப்ஸ் ஆஃப் டென் பயம்ஸ் ஈச் ஆன் டென் சேர ரூலேஷ் which give historic information about the exploits of the chera rulers named paditru patte these are called short poem and long poems as well the, uh, so we have aham poems and puram poem uh, classifications both were collected into eight books called eight anthologies these all go to as early as 1st century bc to 2nd 1st 2nd century ad 10 long poems patth patti 10 anthologies padithu patti next each 10 deals with one chera king sung by one poet each but only eight tens have survived and the other two have not survived but are known through citations these are well structured poems conforming to set grammatical rules and so are creative poems looking almost as historical narratives but are poems utilizing some well known historical events and we a poetic image of each king these were sung by as many as 200 or more poets ranging from kings to common man and also there are many outstanding women poets among them one avayar being the most celebrated poet known for her moving poems now look at the names of some of these uh, poets who have sung great tamil poems in the second century ad gautama valmiki kausika damodara kapila parana markandeya satta bharadwaja nagaraja kanna brahman rudra and others so you see Tamil poem has been composed by the Northerners who have come and settled here, and their contribution to Tamil is reflected in all these poems. Now, they they deal with heroism, liberality, war, birth, death, right, wise counsels of the elder. the duties of the king and family men etc so they give definition of the boundaries where tamil was spoken like tirupati in the north called the tiruvengadam and kanyakumari in the south scattered by the sea on the east called vanga kadal and west western sea now called arabian sea the tamil country was ruled mainly by three crown kings mudi udai vendar muvar they are cheras cholas pandyas and later by pallavas they are mentioned except the pallavas others by asoka in third century all these kings please note all these kings trace the genealogy to well known heroes of the epics ramayana and mahabharata so from even as early as first century and second century the kings called themselves they belong to uh, or they are the descendants of the epic heroes the pandyas called themselves descendants of arjuna of mahabharata the cholas were descendants of rama of ramayana the cheras belonged to the yadavas of krishna they were the descendants of krishna and then pallavas came in the line of drona so you see the main crowned rulers of tamil country they were all 
according to their own report own epigraphical shasana belong to arjuna lineage rama lineage and krishna lineage so they are all nanda now they all say in their own records they studied vedas for example rajendra chola one of the greatest chola ruler in the 11th century he says i studied shastras and vedas in his own record in 11th century all the other uh, uh, great kings they performed uh, sacrifices and made gift to brahmanas the yaga they performed or hiranyagarbha tulabhara go sahasra bahu suvarna rajasuya and asamedha these are all the yagas almost every king every king who has ruled southern part of india particularly tamil nadu he says that he has done velvi yaga is called velvi and they all had had vedic brahmanas at their amitas ministers councillors the settled uh, the kings settled several thousand brahmanas and settled them from northern border in tamil nadu and gave them houses and lands and as brahmadeya they are called brahmadeya so all over tamil nadu there are vedic brahmanas supported by the kings the brahmanas held the kings in judicial and financial administration the vanigas looked after the trade and the vellalas developed agriculture the vellalas were the principal government revenue administrators in tamil nadu in ancient tamil nadu the brahmanas kshatriyas vaisyas and upper caste vellalas studied vedas and so nearly 80% of the population studied vedas however they studied functional vedas not all of vedas like the brahmanas but they studied special selected portion of the vedas but they studied vedas so they were called dvijas rice bowl all of them not only brahmana they also speak of the land where classical tamil was spoken and some regions where more colloquial tamil was spoken secondly the poems speak of jambu dwipa meaning india bharat starting from the himalayas uh, in the north to kanyakumari region engulfed by the sea in the south there was a belief that a large part of land beyond kanyakumari in the south went under the sea evidently this preserves a memory going back to remote antiquity of some land of tamil nadu that has gone under the sea from very early times the tamils followed manus dharma shastra from the beginning tamils followed the four fold purusharthas dharma which is called aram in tamil artha purul in tamil kama inbam in tamil and moksha veed liberation dharma artha kama moksha are called four purusharthas and the tamils followed these four purusharthas vedic sacrifices were common along with of course the local sacrifice almost all the rulers of tamil nadu in the sangam age have performed vedic sacrifices we have a pandya palyagasalai mudugudumi peruvelidi a pandya who has, who has performed several yagas palyagasala then etola rajasuyam vet perunarkilli is a chola karihala chola is another great chola 
His name is also there. He seems to have performed several Vedic sacrifices. Then we have Charan Sanguttuvan, performer of Rajasuya. So the Sangam poems are full of references to kings regularly performing Vedic sacrifices. Marriages among almost all castes were performed as per Vedic rites. The eight different kinds of marriages mentioned in the Dharma Shastras are mentioned in ancient Tamil grammar and were performed. The regular approved marriage was as prescribed in the Dharma Shastra and conducted and supervised by Vedic Brahmanas, which was called Karpu. The Tamil extolled Karpu as the best form of marriage and a bride to remain chaste was called Patni. So she is adored as the very goddess Durga, Patni Kadavul. The marriage of Kovalan and Kanagi in the great text Karan were performed by Panigrahana system and circumambulating the sacrificial fire with the accompaniment of Vedic mantra. Many references are found in Sangam literature to the Vedic form of marriage, especially in Aga Nanuru. The household Grahastha was called Il Varvam. Il means Graha, Varvam means where it resides. So it is an exact translation of the Sanskrit word Grihastha is Il Varvam. Next. Tiruvalluvar also deals with Tapasvi and Sanyasi. Next. You see, so we have Tiruvalluvar in a Tirukural referring to Brahmachari, Grihastha, Tapasvi, and Sanyasi. One of the most important texts, this one, in modern Tamil textual, quite appropriately, is Tirukural by Tiruvalluvar. This is ascribed to 1st century BC. The extraordinary, wonderful text is virtually an abridgment of Dharma Shastra, especially of Manu. There are several rituals like Pancha Maha Yajna, five daily offerings mentioned in the Dharma Shastra, which are prescribed by Valduvar. According to G. U. Pope, who made an extensive study of Trikural in the 19th century, states that it follows Bhagavad Gita, Sankara's Advaita Vedanta, and other system, Indian systems, which followed the Vedic tradition. The worship of the dead was very popular and performed as per Vedic rites. Both internal trade and external international trade were in the hands of the Vanigas. It was well known. Particularly, the Roman trade was frequently referred to. As a result, there was also some artistic tradition in the West mingling with the local art tradition. Now, the Tamils, they worship. Indra, Varuna, Krishna, Muruga, Durga, Balrama, Rama, Kali, Saptamata, and so on. So all these are Vedic gods. From early time, the Tamils followed fourfold Varna system based on professions. Chatur Varnyam Maya Srishtam Guna Karma Vibhagataha, says Krishna in Bhagavad Gita. So, the division into uh, Brahmana, Kshatriya, Vaisya, and so on, they were based on profession and not by birth. 
Brahmana was called Parpanan. Kshatriyas were called Arasar. Vaisyas were called Vanigar. Velala were called Land Owning Velalas. There are also other mixed castes. This was not restricted to only four castes. There are many, many mixed castes. They were all recognized by the Dharma Shastra and they had their own profession separately allotted. These are mentioned in grammar, Thalkapya, Sangam literature, and inscriptions. According to literary tradition, the Pandya rulers established the Sangam assembly to study and patronize Tamil language and literature. However, they claim that they learned Tamil from sage Agatya, who is called the Tamil sage. Another point that they encouraged was the translation of the Mahabharata into Tamil. Frequently, it is referred to among the great contributions of the Pandya, the translation of Mahabharata. The Tamils divide their lands into four plus one, five divisions. Hilly region, forest region, cultivable land, coastal land, desert or mixed land, where two different types of regions uh, mix and where you have doubt whether it is a hilly region or a forest region, that's called desert. This is based on Vedic classification. Now, music and dance traditions in the Tamils are based on Bharata's Natya Shastra. The famous Tamil grammar, Tulkapyam, is derivative of is a derivative of the Bharata's Natya Shastra. Thank you. That was wonderful. Uh, can you stop sharing uh, sharing the screen so that we can see yeah. you? Yes, I can. We can uh, we cannot see you full screen. Yeah, I just. Uh, Stop sharing the screen if you don't mind. There must be a stop share button there. Yes, now we can see you. So, uh, yeah, so your talk was being uh, uh, live streamed on YouTube, and I can see lots of people who have. Uh, left their comments and questions. So it was amazing. Thank you so much. Uh, now I, uh, because I have the privilege of being the anchor, I think I will ask the first question. Uh, so why is there so much of a, a whole a large scale misunderstanding about uh, Tamil Nadu's uh, Vedic connections? I mean, it is so intertwined with Vedic culture. Why is there such a misunderstanding about it? it uh... It, it, it is inseparable for those who read. Hmm. For those who don't read, who would like to be emotionally attached to the language, they would love to say that this is uh, unique, this is separate, this, the culture is separate, etc. We must um, appreciate their affection toward the language, but we cannot accept their. Uh, Emotional uh, dating and isolation and intimacy. It's not possible. Absolutely impossible to separate it. And this has been mentioned by all great scholars who have studied. In order to say that this is separate from the other, I must also know what is the other one. If you don't know both, you cannot say that this is different, that is different. You must know both to compare and say this is this, this is not this, and so on. Unfortunately, till about 1950, 
the Tamil scholars, almost all great Tamil scholars were great Sanskrit scholars. They never had the idea of separation, independence. But the time came when the British colonial rule came in, along with the missionaries also came in. They wanted to rule this country perpetually and make these people uh, perpetually slaves in the colonial rule. They never thought things changed. The world is not what they think. In fact, in one or two of their uh, dispatches uh, in the uh, 1780s, so they have said the white man is born to rule the world. And of course, uh, well, that is a different period. We have nothing to say about them. But now, Everything changes. Suddenly you don't know what change takes place. Look at what the whole world, whole of our life is changing now. We don't know how to go. So uh, one has to know both. To say whether it is an independent, separate culture or what. Its script is the same. Its composition is the same. And music is the same. Dan is the same. Administration is the same. Judicial administration is the same. Even drafting of governmental orders in the 10th century and even earlier period are the same. And they didn't distinguish because immediately they also used the Tamil language. So it's, they were bilingual language, bilingual records. So there was no conflict at any point of time in early period. That these two were different and this is different. So at every period of time when uh, Tamil Nadu was ruled by different rulers, uh, they always felt civilizationally integrated with, uh, with the Vedas, with Vedic traditions. Yes. Right? Mm. No, 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 no. The civilization is what is found in other parts of India. Mm. Birth, education, marriage, childbirth, and external activities tapas, and then sannyasa. These are followed all over India. Though there are several languages. You have Kannada, you have Kalinga, you have Maharashtra, you have Assamese, you have Uttar Pradesh, and so on, Bajpuri, and so on. But the culture is the same. Their lifestyle is the same. The, uh, 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 but, but the divine poems they use are the same. The sequence is the same. So there is uh, each region is like a flower. That flower flowers into uh, color, fragrance, but, but uh, fundamentally it is the same, one and the same, from Kashmir to Kanyakumari. And for scholars, great uh, great scholars who have written about the history of India, world civilization. They will tell you that this civilization was not only confined. Today it is cut off into Bangladesh and Afghanistan and Pakistan and so on. But in, in ancient times, the spread was from India to bacteria, Persia, Parthia, Babylon, and Alexandria in the, in the, in the uh, what you call uh, uh, West Asia and go up in the north, right up to Uzbekistan, where Prakrit poems have been found. Mm. Buddha Dharma has been found. And Asoka, a great ruler, said that I sent Dharma Mahamatras with medicine and with special plants and also the dharma, right up to Alexandria. And he mentions the countries and the kings who have ruled those places where this has been sent. And those kings, from about 3rd century to 3rd century AD, for about 300 to 400 years, you see hundreds of coins have been issued by them. On one side, they write in Greek, and on the other side, they write in Prakrit. Not one coin, not two coins. And what are the God they represent? They represent Balrama, Krishna, who 
a Bactrian king, a Greek king. He represents in his coin, the coin which is circulated among the common people of that region, who use it. They have it in the hand. Who is the god in that coin is Krishna and Balrama. Rudra, by the standing by the side of the Indra, uh, 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 coming on elephant. Nasatya. Nasatya is one of the Achani Devatas. Achani Devatas are those who carry uh, medicine. And they always come in hearth. And they have represented that. And then Maharaja Adi Rajasya. Taratarasya. And so on. Huh? Antiochus. Antiochus. This is written in Prakrit. Where? In bacteria. In Greek country. In Alexandria. Right after Alexandria. So, they know. The, why? Because the code of conduct for rule that made those, they, they were all uh, wild forest regions. You know, controlling is very difficult. So the kings found that this gives a very good idea for them to how to control the people, how to have a beautiful civilization. That's why it is called Dharma. Dharati, it supports civilized life. Right. So it is Dharma up to that. And here, every king in Southeast Asia, they say, I follow Manu. I am like Manu. Mm -hmm. I repaired my palace. King Rajendra Varman in the 9th, 10th century in uh, Cambodia, he says, I repaired my, uh, my palace, which was not occupied for some time, like Ayodhya uh, with, the golden, with, with the golden covers. And I want to establish, as Rama established Rama Rajya in that country. And this is here, not in India. Hmm. But this inscription, 9th century, written in Sanskrit, is still there, preserved in that country in Cambodia, several thousand miles away in the east, southeast. So I am not speaking about China, because China also has got our own uh, contact, connection. So it is, it, it is beyond our imagination how this culture, civilization went and made people respect each other. There was no conflict. So, so, when the culture spread, Indian culture spread to Southeast Asia, um, so what about Tamil language? How, how did that uh, move through the region? Was it language spoken there? Differs. Language uh -huh. differs. Uh -huh. uh, even the human form differs. Hmm. But the practices, Mm -hmm. the life and what is their aim, they are all, they refer again and again and again to Vedas. Yeah, yoga, yoga is one of the things that united all these people right after Alexandria. What is yoga? It is nothing to do with religion. It is your discipline, personal discipline, physical discipline, Mental discipline. It's not twisting the body and uh, gymnastics. It's not yoga. Yoga is controlling every aspect of your human body and also mind. And that gives you an eternal joy. And that is samadhi. And when Buddha, Buddha Dharma is taught in the Central Asia or in all these places, they have issued coins, gold coins with Buddha. Buddha in second, first century BC. It is easy for them to absorb it. Right. So it is not restricted or divided by religion or caste. It is one substratum all over. So you, you do not find any evidence of Tamil being spoken in Southeast Asia? Uh, Tamil, Tamil language itself? Yeah. Tamil spoken by those who went there okay. at ah. some point of time, mm -hmm. not many. Mm -hmm. We have one very good reference to a um, uh, person, a learned Vedic Brahmana from Kanjivaram to go to uh, what you call uh, Cambodia in the 8th century. So he was one with his three sons. He went there. 
but once he went there, the king found he is a very knowledgeable man. And so he made him his counselor, gave him a, his name is Dharmakirti. Wow. And three of his sons, one son was the protector of the palace. The other son was the commander in chief of the army. The third son was the commander in chief of the uh, navy. And he gave the land, this man, utilize the students to do good work in uh, building temples, in digging uh, what you call tanks, irrigation tanks. The students were employed in irrigation tanks in the uh, rest of us. And that's how he made it a prosperous country hmm. like that. But this is one or two. Okay. But they spoke only Sanskrit. Okay. So it was mainly Sanskrit. <laughs> Okay. Uh, so there is a question from uh, YouTube. Uh, one person is asking, uh, he says that Saraswati dried up, right? Saraswati River dried up uh, uh, around 2500, uh, I think around 2000 BC. So uh, does that not affect the dating of uh, Manusmiti and all? Because you said Manusmiti was 1000 BC. I don't say that. Uh -huh. But now we have solid evidences. Mm -hmm. to show that. Mm -hmm. Now, there is a place called near Bhopal, Sanchi. Mm -hmm. And there is a big stupa on top of a small hill. And this stupa, there are two or three more stupa there. Eh? Now, uh, there are Toranas, beautiful Toranas, Buddhist. In third century, in the time of uh, Asoka, it had been built. And there, there is a reference to Acharya Kula. Anybody who takes away this culture, damages this culture, will fall into the sin of uh, destroying Acharya Kula. What is this Acharya Kula? There is one Dharma Sastra written by Apastamba. Apastamba Dharma Sutra. And that, he says, the Brahmachari strain is called Acharya Kula. So, 3rd century BC, the usage of Apastamba is found inscribed on the uh, stupa. Apastamba refers to another Dharma Shastrakara, Gautama. So, obviously, who is much earlier, 3rd century to at least 200 years, 300 years earlier, Gautama. His work is there. He says also a law book very highly law book. And Gautama refers to Manu. You see, we have solid evidences to show that he was. In fact, the early scholars who studied Manu Dharma Shastra, they said he lived in 1200 BC. Though we are not able to fix 1200 or 1000, approximately. But he is definitely earlier than Gautama, and he is so it is a thousand. And Asoka, what he has written in so many places, Dharma, 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 Ime Dhamma Gunaha. What are the Dharma Gunas? He says, what are the Dharma? Satyam Vada, Dharma Chara. You see, these are the things, simple things. And then he says, what are the qualifications? Your, your personal um, achievement, qualities. He gives that. And that is exactly as given by Manu's Dharma Chatra. That's what he says is Dharma Chara. What? Why do you call Buddha as Buddha? This is all mentioned in Dharma Chatra. One who performs tapas and gets knowledge in the forest region, he is Buddha, Jnani, Mauni. All these are all words used for Buddha. Buddha lived in 5th century. There is nobody who questions his Buddha. He lived in 5th century. And so he, the Dharma that has been prescribed, Manu himself says, I didn't write it. I am not the author of all this. I only collected what is there in the Veda. What is there in the Veda? There is a Upanishad. 
Tai Triya Upanishad. That says, Dhammam Chara Satyam Mada Matri Devo Bhava Putri Devo Bhava Acharya Devo Bhava Atiti Devo Bhava All these are mentioned in the Upanishad. And that's what Manu takes it, codifies it into not only that, but other uh, relationship. And then he formed this, uh, he himself says, I just, because I am very close to Veda, then you and he. And at that time, we have the system of committing to memory. And the earliest Vedic Rig Veda has been committed to memory and remain to this day from memory. And so all these sastras were all committed to memory. And I committed to memory the Vedas. So from the Vedas, I am collecting it and codifying them. That's what he says. So it's not a question of uh, 10,000. It's not that. Of course, there is a lot of work that needs to be done, I think, in chronology from the traditional uh, perspective, right? Uh, because uh, archaeology gives you one perspective, but there's also because everything has not been dug up yet. There is still a lot of work to be done in archaeology. No, uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, please, unfortunately, uh -huh. when India overnight went into the hands of the colonial rulers, hmm. they tried to suppress whatever is here and say that what they have uh, projection. It's the greatest thing. And, but there are also people who realize that in order to rule these people, we should know what is their customs, what is their manner, what is their lifestyle, what are the texts and so on. So William Jones and others, they studied it and translated it. But at that time, there was not so many publications. Everything was in, in uh, palm leaf manuscripts or patras. And now you have thousands. We have a computer to help us. So when you start reading it, you know, we are, we, we, ours is not to find fault with what happened in the previous generation, but I am to see what is there originally and how they treated it. And here you see one simple example. We have one much publicized language. Indo-European language. <laughs> Indo-European language. Right. There are many commonness between this and this. They were not wrong. Common forms of usages, words, and so on are there. So they say that Indo-European language. But sir, in between Indo-European, India and Europe, which is beyond Black Sea, beyond the Greek world in Europe. In between, there are so many languages. Persian was there, Parthian was there, Bactrian was there, Babylonian was there. So many languages. Did we jump from here to there? <laughs> Indo-European language? What about the in-between languages? It's a concocted, completely concocted language. <laughs> But, but the thing is that though they, they, they could go only up to that, their uh, equipment was that much. Right. But now we can't the Indo-European language. You have to take up Parsi, Persians, Parthians, right. uh, Arabian, Armenian. Mm. So many things are there. So yeah. we need to take history, chronology, verifiable data. Without this, my emotion, of course, I feel like, yes, I, why not? I want to be in heaven. There is no heaven where I can, I can go to that. No, no, we are not letting you go now. <laughs> uh, so one more uh, question, Mahashaya. Uh, this is, uh, there's a question that uh, we, are not, we do not find any ruins of the palaces of Cholas and uh, Pandyas and Pallavas. Why is that? Uh, though for the Northern Indian... We have people, a very good... Mm -hmm. We have a very good custom. You see, not only here, everywhere it is the same thing. Uh -huh. 
when you conquer the opponent's uh, uh, country the first thing they plunder the palace because of wealth and treasures and gems and uh, other things second by destroying it this fellow feels he has conquered him once and for all so they destroy they destroy the uh, what you call the palaces or the opponents but here you have um, so opponents destruction not only that they inflict also some sort of a shame on the uh, fellow who lost his kingdom and who lost the battle they put uh, this kadhi ele cc cc they they uh, uh, plant cc and plow the field with uh, what you call uh, as donkey this is as if he has inflicted the greatest uh, shame on the conquered that's not the thing but um, the palaces beneath the surface of chola are there that we have excavated okay. uh, pandian ning has not been excavated 17th century onwards nine palaces are available okay. so we have an uh, continued our excavation you see so what about yeah, agraharas uh, we find lot of agraharas in the southern part of india but in the northern part we don't find them right agraharas have they been destroyed there are there, there are agraharas there. Huh? agraharas agraharas there are there sasana gramas they are called sasana baddha gramas mm-hmm. they are there in kalinga in up in bihar and all oh, that we don't know there? oh okay yes i see we don't hear yes. much about them huh? we don't hear much about them well nobody reads because the brahmin was always a poor fellow <laughs> he is not supposed to accumulate wealth you know according right. to dharma shastra right poverty in simplicity mm-hmm. in in thinking that he reaches a, a, the highest state not by wealth money is not the great thing so poor fellow he will be living in small home but uh, when well was there improved in india in the 10th 12th 12th century as a root of this the money was here circulating and when foreign invasion came they removed all this wealth particularly we have a tradition of going and giving everything to the temple i need not go and fight in the battlefield i just go into the temple kill four or five fellows i get so much of money so the temples were the repositories of wealth and and the invader he found it very easy to take away the wealth and they they took away all the wealth and also uh, islamic invasion came they uh, prohibited public uh, worship and public exhibition of festivals and so on so the poor fellow they have to keep quiet we have not improved <laughs> hmm. uh, so one more question is about the excavation a uh, recent excavation in uh, kiladi right the kiladi i don't know how to pronounce it right kiladi ah okay kiladi this is right. another ah uh, uh, so does it change we, anything we the, excavate ah uh-huh. we excavate a site from what you call a different uh, signs and symbols we get from the surface from literature from inscription and fix the importance of the site to find out whether there is any relic that gives you more information so this is a scientific investigation exploration before excavation now the things have changed like our covid 19 you know the what they want i think i must prove this is early so i will excavate and whatever small thing i get i'll say oh i have found out the latest thing that's not excavation excavation in key ready key means eastern adi adi means 
boundary, boundary, key ID is the boundary, eastern boundary of a big town, big city. What are that city? This has been written about 100 years ago. They don't know even the name of that place. Excavators. It was called Manalur. In Mahabharata, there is a reference to that village, town, Mahabharat. There, it says, there was Manalur, there was a small chieftain king, and Arjuna went down to what you call Kanyakumari, and en route he passed through this place. He found that uh, uh, the chieftain's daughter was very beautiful. He says, I want to marry her. The king said, unless you make him the king of this region, I won't give her in marriage. So Arjuna said, okay, I'll give you, I'll make him the king. So he married her. He went down and by the time he came, uh, 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 the birth to his man. Uh, he was made the king. And that king is called Pandya. The Pandya rulers, Pandya rulers, uh, were the descendants of Arjuna. It's not I say. It is there in Mahabharata. Hundred years ago, learned scholars have studied that Manalur. And after that, the Pandyas, when they came into contact with Agastya, they established the city of Mathura. Mm. What we have today, what we call as Madurai, was only southern Mathura of northern Mathura of Krishna. Amazing. Mm. You see? Right. So, where we have to excavate is at the core. Now we are at the very end. Mm. And at that end, you see, in Tamil Nadu is a very well settled uh, area for the past 2000 years. You dig anywhere, you will get some broken pottery with these inscriptions and so on. Mm. Right. Uh, so, there is a uh, Ramaswamy, you want to ask a question? You, you have no, to unmute no. yourself. There is a question from, uh, I think, Ramaswamy. Uh, Do you have any question? I have, I don't know. Uh, you, okay, so. Some, some concluding words I can give. Uh, so, so you don't have any question? No. Okay. Uh, so uh, also, uh, uh, Dr. Nagaswamy, I want to hear from you about the, the London Nataraja case, because that sounds very exciting. Uh, the whole uh, testimony that you gave I think there was something about how uh, the, the, the statue was buried and you were able to say that it is according to Agama Shastras, it had been buried and all that. Would you like to talk about that? Uh, London. The London Atraja case. Well, huh. the, this, is a, this is a small thing and it is also a big one. It's a small thing is yeah, hmm. that in a village, a small village, there is an old temple Shiva temple, Chola temple, 12th century, mm -hmm. and it fell into ruins. And by nobody was there, but uh, some priest will go and pour some water on the linga. You know, we do it. Uh, but a laborer there, he dug uh, for earth, and he found this one Natraja. Mm -hmm. Along with it, he found another nine figures of Parvati, Somaskanda, Bhairava, Upper, so on. So, uh, that he is a poor man, but he has just heard that if you sell this, you will get a very big money. And so he uh, sent some message. Some fellow smuggler, he got all that return. He said, I will get you a big land, two acres of land. Unfortunately, I have not only brought the money, I have about 200 rupees. You keep it with you. I'll go on bring it. I'll take this matter. He took it that matter for 200 rupees. And then he smuggled it to, uh, as a process of smuggling to Bombay and from Bombay it went to London. And then uh, when it came to know, and, uh, at that time, there was in the Scotland Yard Police, there was a separate department, prevention of uh, antiquities on the art objects. So they used to, but now that is all abandoned. There's no such. Uh, so they 
found one nataraja in somebody's uh, somebody was cleaning it and they went and saw they asked for some help did you get it they are not able to say so they confiscated it they didn't know from where it came so after something they came to delhi uh, from delhi to tamil nadu and uh, they sent him to tamil nadu tamil nadu police office they came to know they know how to get the uh, smugglers so they found that this was from that village it has been smuggled out and so on. and so now we have in, uh, instituted a case in london high court for the return the problem was the temple was in ruins not in regular worship there is no record of this image which was lying buried inside except the man who dug it up and no photograph and why it was buried and so on what happened there are many scientific things. i can't go into all of them there are many scientific investigation went into the metal analysis soil analysis stylistic analysis how do you date how do you date the temple whether this belong to that or it is earlier if it is an earlier one it could not belong to that temple maybe from any other temple like that like that these came up and i was sent as an expert witness to answer all these questions the first question is how do you date a temple so i said we have inscriptions on the base of the temple and uh, on the basis of it how do you date that inscription so we know that is our job we study epigraphy there may be the year may be mentioned or the form of the letter may be guiding us and so we will approximately we will fit the date then they said you think stylistically this image belongs to that particular period how do you fix the style there are hundreds of images all over how will you fix it i have to tell him from actually established images with the help of inscription in different temples to fix the date of that temple. so we have from early 9th century bronzes dated with the help of inscription 10th century bronzes dated with the help of uh, inscription on it like that so chronologically we know and we can tell you even then it may be only near us not full absolute we can't say absolutely this is the one but it is here. then why did they bury it <laughs> why should a temple bury it now that is a very crucial question and the point is in the 13th century when malik afur came down south he went and looted all the temples and temple property as well he said to have taken about 60000 elephant load of gold from south to delhi of course maybe exaggerated but it is what the islamic historians say right and he took that at that time every temple in our village sites karnal is the oh, the islamic invasion is coming he may take away of my god so he was not even worried about the world gold money but his god so he buried it and in such cases what you do with the question and then we have the text called agamas agamas are the temple uh, ritual treatises they tell you when there is danger of epidemic fire invasion flag danger to the uh, temple danger to the images and so on how you do with it there it suggests you dig it quick bury it and how you cover it up and how you symbolically do puja in that and with the prayer i'll come back one day and take you that's all written in agama shastra that is there that is there in in our agamas Mm. in our agama so uh, the judge wanted what agama 
I told him to set him the Alma. He said, get me the Alma. Hmm. And so I gave him the Alma. It is in Sanskrit. And so he said, give me the translation. So I gave the translation. This was given to the other side. He verified whether it is what I say is correct or not in that book. So he said, yes, what he has done is correct. Then uh, I said, whether this book was published after this uh, case came into being or before that? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Long before that. <laughs> it was published in 1920. This has happened in 1970, 50 years after. Hmm. So you give me the Zara copy. So I gave him the Zara copy. Like that, hmm. at every stage, we depend upon Kramana. Evidence, verifiable evidence. So we have to give, and we gave that. And so, the, when when, when the, um, judge came and sat to hear the case, he knew nothing about India. But it went on continuously, day by day, not like this so once you hear. And then afterwards, uh, six years afterwards, the other day, and then again, adjournment like that now. Daily, the case was going on. And when he gave the judgment, he was an excellent art historian of India. That much of study he did. And then he agreed that uh, what uh, Dr. Narasimha says, I agree with you. Okay. Give Thank it back. You. Thank you. Give it back. Mm -hmm. And then they went to a court of appeal. Mm -hmm. Three three senior judges mm -hmm. uh, from the House of Lords, they heard that and they said this is such a case where it's not possible to question it anywhere, dismiss. And they went to Privy Council, Privy Council at the hearing stages, so they said no, go, go back, give it back. So we got it back. Mm -hmm. And so I went to see it one day, mm -hmm. the local officer, new officer, temple officer, he said you won't be allowed to see it. So where is it now? <laughs> where is where is that Natraja now? Somewhere. Somewhere. Uh, last track of all this. No, it's oh. a long time back. No, <laughs> you, you worked so hard to get it back. And, uh, and we don't know. Well, where all things is. happen everywhere. <laughs> mm. But okay. yeah, but the, the point is that we need to have scientific document. Hmm. See, if you say it's about two feet, three inches, you take it there. It was only two feet, two inches. Then the judge can say, this is not that because it's not two feet, three inches, it's only two feet, two inches. Hmm. So we need accurate, accurate documentation. What is accurate documentation? Nobody knows. This is a big challenge. So our own murti is to get them back, right? We have to fight a case. It's it's, it's just tragic at many levels. Uh, you can't. Uh, you see, uh, it also happened uh, in, the, in the Australian uh, in art gallery. Nataraja was brought uh, there. Also, they wanted a document. I gave them the document mm. from inscriptions from that uh, temple. Then he told that, so see, we have the, we have received the document that proving that this Nataraja was under worship there in the temple. So we give back. And then, so we need, we need scientific documentation. But that scientific mind is not there. We have X, Y, Z. Now, you know, appointments are made up. Is it? So, um, we, so, are, we are not up up uh, in the scientific field. You know. It's not emotion. We want science to help us, document to help us. Right. And when you don't look for it, you won't get it. So there is a one question from Dr. Vedvir Arya in YouTube. So he's asking about the origin of the word Tamil. Is he saying, did it come from Dravida to Dramil to Tamil? How did the word Tamil come? Mm -hmm. <laughs> we 
it's, it's again it is again only speculation i don't go into the speculation hmm. now from the very earliest time in this part of the country the language is called tamil hmm. tamil means sweet young vibrant all these meanings are there so that we know from that time onwards but when the northern area outside the tamil country when there are poets who are referring to this when there are kings who are referring to it they don't write it as tamil they used to write it as dramila hmm. so there is a in the second century bc is a karavela of kalinga he has a big inscription he fought with the tamil king he mentions that but there he mentioned this dramila in the pallava copper plate inscriptions they are mentioned when in sanskrit when it comes in sanskrit they are all in double uh, bilingual languages in sanskrit it is called dramila in tamil it is called tamil i see okay so mm. uh, in, in sri lanka we have inscriptions uh, nearly 2000 year old inscription there it is called dramila so we have for the sanskrit or prakrit it's not an actually prakrit dramila for the tamil it is tamil okay uh, there's also a question is there any archaeological evidence of uh, invasion by the cholas in uh, southeast asia any archaeological evidence of that oh plenty uh huh he himself says uh huh அலைகடல் நடுவில் பலகலம் செலுத்தி சங்கிராம விஜயோத்துங்குவர்மனாகிய கடாரத்து அரையனை கும்ப கரியடும் மகப்படுத்தி நிக்கபார் ilamuri desamum now it is called ilamuri desam originally it was lemuria they say lemuri they are looking for lemuria here it was there about sumatra on top so uh, kadaram kadaram is kedda in malaysia in the center above uh, uh, what you call uh, malaysian capital kedda and then you have pinang pinang was connected with india from very early time on because our ships used to go all along the coast not cutting across because this is easy into going over the land land you have to cross you know paras or river and so many things you go along the ship easy nothing else except it takes some time like that so when they went round went to bengal bengal to burma burma to uh, what you call malaysia they went along the coast and pinang and down south pinang you have this kedda mm-hmm. kedaram this is kedaram so um, kinds have been found uh, they all the places he mentions they are all there they are all mentions in hundreds of uh, rajendra chola inscription mm-hmm. and also subsequent inscriptions so that is uh, untouched so it was just a, it was an invasion uh, but it did not uh, was it a very violent one was it very uh, did it lead to casualties or anything like how was it uh, which one uh, i mean this invasion of cholas what was it uh, uh, is there a description of it uh, we have a description it's a long description in the uh, what you call uh, rajendra uh, Uh-huh. He, he he brought uh, what you call the torana uh-huh. uh, there was some trade clash you know okay uh, because they had a very intimate trade with china hmm. originally from the chola country hmm. uh, ship they used to go there and fight and uh, there was some uh, conflict it was exactly is there in the chinese uh, annals also they say that because 
His father, Rajendra's father, Rajaraj Chola, who is the builder of the great temple of Tanjore, hmm. has given 1,000 valleys of land for a Buddha Chaitya to be erected there by the king of uh, Kadaram. Hmm. Here, in, in Tamil Nadu at Nagapatnam. Hmm. So they were in such a close uh, relationship, friendship. Hmm. But suddenly it changed. There was some fight. Rajendra has to fight. Mm -hmm. and after that, they didn't know really. okay. These are all just raids, you know, just to show that you are superior. So long as that fellow is there, you will send his tribute. Or if this fellow is divided, you will send his dispute. That's all. Okay. They but never they posted their officers to rule over that. Even in, in India, mm -hmm. in one conquered the other country. Mm -hmm. It was they, not colonization. It was not a colonization. Country. Mm -hmm. They give it back to them. This is Dharma. This is Dharma. Okay. No, it is not my Dharma. Okay, and the other question that I've got from people is that you your books are not available on Amazon. Uh, so uh, how do how do people buy your books? Actually, I myself, when I wanted to buy uh, Tamil Nadu Land of the Vedas, I went to your house in Chennai last in the last December and got it from your son. I bought it from him because it was not on Amazon. So people are asking, where can we buy your books? See, <laughs> I, I, I have my... Internet, uh, internet connection, I have Tamil Arts Academy. Uh -huh. apply, uh -huh. I'll tell you how to, it is very simple. Okay. I don't have a big organization. It's not a commercial organization. Mm. Uh, I don't feel very happy to sell books, which is mm. knowledge is not sold. But so, and also you give it to them, they will never give you back the money and uh, you don't get it at all. Uh, you can't give from the private uh, company. So that much of interest I don't have. So uh, the Tamil Nadu Academy. Right, I, Tamil it is available. All, all my books are available with my, in my address as you can. All books are available. I have, I know, it has gone to three editions, you know. My, yes, yes. Uh, uh, I think within uh, India. Uh, so I waited to come to India so that I can go to Chennai and then buy your book. I have it. Let us work. Yes, yes. So, you know, so, you, you are a storehouse of information. My next book, my next book would be a little more. I, I speak about the Southeast Asian contact and uh, West Asian contact and uh, okay. To, uh, okay. Thank you so much. It, it is absolutely wonderful. I can talk, listen to you all day. Uh, so, uh, but I think we have to. There's a time limit. So, Subramani, are you ready to say something? Would you like to say something? You have to unmute yes. yourself. Please go ahead. Uh, sir, uh, Nagasami, sir. Uh, yes, thank you a lot. Amen. Thanks a lot. Tamil Nadu is the ah, huh? uh, Tamil Nadu is the land of Vedas, as you rightly said. The Pandya, Ch Chera, Pallava, Ch Chola kings, Rajendra, Ch Rajaraja Chola, Rajendra Chola, all were great patrons of Vedas. We are looking forward to a book from you on how the Pandya kings patronize Vedas, as because I work in Madurai, Pandyas have been neglected. And a lot of work has been done on Cholas, but Pandyas have been neglected. So uh, we are proud of you, sir. You are a monument by yourself. Bharatiya said, Vedam Nirinda Tamil Nadu. So Tamil Nadu is really the land of Vedas. And Madurai, there's an ancient Sangam poem. Madurai wakes to the sound of Vedas. So, Namaskar, sir. Namaskar. Thank, thank, you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Uh, as, uh, Dr. Subroto, uh, I would now request our president, uh, president of IHAR, Dr. Subroto Gangopadhyay, if he can uh, give some concluding remarks. Subroto ji. Um, sorry, I was not expecting to be some. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, our, our humble. Uh, yeah, I, I hope it was not very prosaic or professorial. It was it it was absolutely delightful, and our uh, pranams to you, and uh, our uh, humble thanks to you. It was a delightful, delightful morning, and I am so grateful that despite your preoccupations and obviously your withdrawal from some of the public life, 
you have graced uh, us again once after 2012 when Jay Kumar had you there. And um, I'm equally grateful to Rama Subramani for having um, come back from, from visiting his parents and his village to come contact you and, and gently persuade you <laughs> to join us. I hope we shall be enriched by your presence. I wish you a a, a continuity of a long and healthy life because you are continuity and we want to maintain continuity and we pray to Ishwara that, that you continue like this and from time to time we shall be with you and contact you for your suggestion and wisdom. So uh, with uh, humble um, again, thanks from all of us at IHAR and all our audiences and thanks to Sahana Ji, thanks to Subramani Ji, thanks to all our audiences. Uh, we we now uh, close this and we will be in touch with you. Dhaniwad. Thank, Thank you. you. Namaste. Thank you.